Okay, so everybody, you're very welcome to the Executive Office Committee meeting this afternoon. Um, we have item one in terms of apologies. Uh, Trevor Lunn and George Robinson have told us that they're running just a, a little bit late, but we hope that they'll be joining us shortly. Um, in terms of Chairman's business, just a couple of items. Number one, just uh, maybe to begin by utterly condemning the recent attack on the PSNI officer in Don Given with the planting of the bomb. And this really harks back to the old days, and it's an approach that we rejected north and south on the island of Ireland, uh, and we're certainly going to reject it now. Uh, and we would ask that uh, this type of activity stops, and we offer our support to that police officer and indeed the wider uh, police community as they go about their job. Um, Maybe just to uh, update members as well, uh, there was an informal meeting last week with the chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on the issues to be relating to the protocol, uh, mostly just conversation based between chairs of various committees from the Assembly. Uh, not really many actions out of it, more just a discussion on some of the issues that people were facing. Uh, and there will be another meeting of those probably in June time. Um, also, maybe just to continue to suggest to people from all forums that we continue with our drive in uh, vaccinations for coronavirus. Uh, if people are bored, um, they can look at my Twitter feed, and I have a short video up of getting my jab this morning, uh, and I got that. So uh, my arm, a little bit sore, a little bit, tiny bit tender, but not too bad, um, but obviously encouraging as many people as possible uh, to get the vaccination so that we can... Uh, try and beat this uh, coronavirus head on. So, uh, and if at any point you hear me saying that Doug has to take over, that you may there may have been uh, some sort of side effects, but feeling good at the minute. So uh, we move on then to item three, which is the draft minutes, which are at page six of the meeting pack. Are members content that that's the uh, an agreed minute of the meeting from last week? Okay. That's grand, that's that sorted. Well, then that allows us then to move on to item five, which is the historical institutional abuse, the oral briefing from the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse. There are papers available on page 1738 of the meeting pack, and Fiona Ryan is with us if we bring her up into the spotlight. And welcome, Fiona, once again, back to the committee. You're very welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, whenever we met with you the last time, you had just um, more or less taken up post and were settling in. Uh, so we would be uh, keen maybe just to hear how you've been getting on over the last couple of months, uh, get a little bit of an update on your work, and maybe we can have some questions and answers just afterwards, just maybe on some of the issues that have been raised with ourselves during that time. But we're delighted to pass back over to yourself and we'll give you the floor to update members. Um, thanks so much, Colin. Uh, I just want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity again to meet with you. Um, as you know, and just to reflect what Colin said, our office came into being on the 14th of December and central to my approach since taking up post has been to engage with victims and survivors as individuals, but also the representative groups. I think it's really important that we realise that there is a large community of victims and survivors and they are in Northern Ireland, but they are also in Great Britain. They are in Australia. They are scattered around the globe, but the majority would still be in Northern Ireland and Great Britain, at least based on our queries from what we've received from victims and survivors contacting us. Um, I've also been engaging with providers of services to victims and survivors in this context. And as I'm sure the committee is aware, under the Historical Institution Abuse Northern Ireland 2019 Act, it's not easy to say, which I'll just call legislation from now on, I have duties to encourage the provision and coordination of a range of relevant services to victims and survivors and to monitor some services. And I'd like to tell you a bit more about those um, going forward. Um, before I go any further, though, I want to thank the victims and survivors who have reached out to us. Um, both through groups, but also as individuals. And we're very conscious for victims and survivors to make any contact with any agency or body, albeit ourselves, which are independent. It takes a lot of courage. So we're really grateful for that fact. Um, also in relation to um, services, as you rightly said, um, I think it was only five weeks in post um, when I uh, made my first appearance in front of the committee. I'm now four months in post. And I'd like to think that every day, as they say, as I've learned in Belfast, the phrase every day is a school day, you know, and every day I'm learning more and more about the reality of victims and survivors and about their key needs and interests. 
Um, so what I'd like to do is just give the uh, committee a summary of what's presenting to me and just ask for perhaps for your assistance with some issues as well in terms of raising awareness of these issues. Um, as I said, I have monitoring responsibilities under legislation and these extend to the redress board. Um, to that end, my office has engaged with over 204 queries from victims and survivors in the past four months, with 95 of these queries directly related to the redress process. The queries we receive go beyond the general information and advice envisaged by legislation, and they can include complex legal and procedural matters. But even when the calls are on general advice, I think it's really important that the committee understands that to apply for redress itself means confronting your past, acknowledging your past, and it may require disclosure. It is an incredibly emotional process for victims and survivors. And I think we need to be um, trauma informed and aware at each stage of the process. You know, so like I said, even a routine call to us can mean, you know, a victim and survivor having to demonstrate a level of trust and also share. And it's sometimes they're not even prepared for what they are going to share themselves. So I think that's useful. Um, as I said, I have specific monitoring responsibility for the redress board and the committee asked me recently for my opinion with regards to certain operational aspects of redress, specifically in relation to panel numbers and with respect to progressing applications and communications with victims and survivors. I know the committee asked me those questions in response to, you know, um, concerns that were expressed to yourselves. I provided my response to the committee on the 18th of March. My views remain the same, but I'm happy to reiterate. As it stands, one year on in operation, 506 applications have gone to final determination. Now, we understand that the redress board was established under the presumption that there would be 5,000 applications for redress. So that would suggest, based on current figures, that you could be looking at up to 10 years to complete this work. And frankly, you know, for victims and survivors, the majority of whom are in their 60s and 70s, albeit there are victims and survivors in their late 40s, 50s, you know, asking someone to potentially consider a 10 year timeline, it's just not acceptable. So, you know, victims and survivors have waited long enough. And I think it's important that we understand that the rate of progression would need to increase. Um, I've asked the board how cases and applications and waiting times are being managed. And I did share that with you. For example, I've asked, is there active case management of cases? Are waiting lists being triaged for length of time in the system? I mean, I've had people say to me, look, Fiona, I've been in this, I've been on the list since April or May. You know, I mean, what's happening here? And, you know, the reality is we can put in the query and try and find out. But, you know, you're talking about potentially nearly a year on. I've also asked if a Section 14 initial payment could be made to victims and survivors earlier in the process, once details of their abuse has been established. And based on these figures, I think it's logical to ask, and I think we all want to know, what steps has the board undertaken to plan for an additional 500 applications or 1,000 applications? You know, I mean, this is, and this is not rocket science. This is basically, if you were a service provider, you know, and anyone who's worked in services would say, that's the normal forecasting you have to undertake. So we need to basically say, you, this forecasting needs to be engaged with. Because if you have something like, for example, an apology or even a big public campaign, that is going to result in an increase in applications for redress. And finally, and this is something I've spoken to you about individually, I've spoken to you as a committee, I have to ask, where is the communication with the victim and survivor? They're being asked once again to trust the state and engage in a process, which many of them have shared with me, has left them feeling powerless again. So how can we get the perspective of victims and survivors to be incorporated into the redress process? where their individual application experiences are not being sought or taken into consideration. And I'd also offer, I mean, the redress process as it's set up is highly legalistic. It is based on a solicitor relationship. And I wouldn't be suggesting that, you know, there's a substitute for, you know, sound legal advice, but there has to be choice for victims and survivors, you know, where they get their information, or just a general update. You know, if you look at even any of us in the middle of COVID, even the most simple online experience, you know, you receive a lot of communications as you move through the different stages of a process. 
that's not the same for victims and survivors. I mean, we're constantly being asked, okay, well, I'm at this stage. How long will it take to the next stage? They don't have an idea of the overview. And, you know, relying on solicitors in the middle of COVID where people may not even be in the office, it's not really good enough for victims and survivors. Um, and I realize I'm presenting to the committee here very practical, pragmatic, real life issues for victims and survivors in relation to redress. Our queries cover many, many other issues, but these are just some of the process issues. So length of time it's taken to process and just having another human being to talk to and ask what's going on with this process. They're not big, I don't think they're big asks. Um, I do wish to bring to the attention of the committee an urgent redress related matter. And that relates to victims and survivors of historic institution abuse now resident in Great Britain. And um, we know that one in eight victims and survivors who apply for redress are resident in Great Britain. And as it stands, the 2019 Act allows for redress awards to be disregarded for means of tax, national assurance, fees for residential care homes and nursing homes, and means tested social security benefits in Northern Ireland. That is not the situation in Great Britain, where under the current arrangements, redress awards can take, technically be taken into account for all of these purposes. The matter is further complicated when you get into housing benefit, which is assessed by local authorities and then council tax. I mean, to provide the committee with more insight into this issue, and I've shared this with the committee in my briefing, I spoke a couple of weeks ago with an elderly survivor based in England who was highly distressed and fearful that she would lose either her redress award or her benefits because of the current situation. Um, subsequent to my briefing to yourselves, I actually contacted, I wrote to the council in question and just asked them in general, and they confirmed that this was the situation. Now, she's not the only victim and survivor in this situation. As I said, one in eight um, applicants for redress is based in Great Britain, and we've gotten that information from the redress board itself. If you want to talk to the victims and survivors um, service, they would say one in six of the victims and survivors who sought support from them were resident in Great Britain. And our own experience as an office would suggest, that based on our queries, again, a significant number of people, victims and survivors living and resident in Great Britain. I mean, some of the people have shared with me that they never want to step on this island again. They never want to come back because of what was done to them. And at the same time, they feel like they've been forgotten so I think this issue, again, I brought this issue to the attention of the executive office shortly after taking up post. And I understand that the executive office is in communication with the Department of Work Pensions colleagues to resolve the matter, but there's still no resolution to the issue. And I'm urging all the parties involved to resolve the situation as a priority in order to re reduce the unnecessary distress to this community of victims and survivors, many of whom are elderly, I would offer that if the state wants victims and survivors of institutional childhood abuse to apply for redress, then these impediments of applying need to be removed. I'd also offer, and I appreciate hindsight is a great thing, and there was a definite urgency to establishing the redress board. But I would suggest that it would have been better if the consequences of this legislative arrangements had been identified, considered, and resolved when the 2019 Act was first drafted in order to avoid this exact situation. And perhaps a co design process involving victims and survivors could potentially have provided an insight into the issue. And indeed, referring back to redress in general could have ensured a more victim and survivor centered development process. Um, obviously, I've spoken to you in relation to the wider issues of the, the redress board. And you know, I was delighted that my recommendation to the new president of the redress board, Mr. Ian Huddleston, uh, Mr. Justice Ian Huddleston rather, that he meet with victims and survivors groups representatives as a priority was taken up. Those meetings occurred on the 31st of March and the 1st of April. And while the offer to meet was generally welcomed, again, victims and survivor groups have reflected to me that their sense is that the board does not have an insight into their experience as victims and survivors as they apply for redress. And again, this goes back to the lack of victim and survivors involvement in a co-design process. And again, I want to stress that I understand the need for expediency and urgency at the time, but it did not happen in relation to the development and operationalization of the redress board. As I've said to the committee, again, <laughs> I'm conscious that I reiterate this, the board has been in operation for a year, it has a real 
real opportunity to review its operations and to incorporate the experiences of victims and survivors engaging in the redress process in how it provides this service. And you know, the reality is we know this even from, you know, to use another example from any form of service provision or business, that the more you involve the people whom you're engaging with in delivering a service, the better the services that you deliver and you get better at doing what you're supposed to do. As an aside, in the coming weeks, we'll be launching a website for the Commissioner's Office. And our intention is to, besides letting people know how they can contact us, um, is to let victims and survivors know um, how they can apply for redress and with answers to the most common redress related queries that we've received up on the website. Um, our intention is that this will be another source of information on applying for redress for victims and survivors. And we hope that it will be useful, you know, just as an aside again for the committee, and I suppose this is the human angle. We get a lot of queries from sons and daughters, you know, from families wanting to apply for redress on behalf of their moms and dads. They want to do the best for them. And we're hoping that by providing this information, we might make their journey just a little bit easier. Um, I spoke earlier about services. When I spoke to you last, I hadn't had as much opportunity at that point to engage with as many services, providing services to victims and survivors as I'd wanted to. I've since had that opportunity. And you know, without going through the details of the legislation, I think people are probably quite surprised um, that I actually, under the legislation, I have a duty to encourage the provision and coordination of a range of relevant services to victims and survivors. And these include um, to improve a person's physical or mental health, to help a person overcome addiction, to provide a person with counseling, to improve a person's literacy or numeracy, provide a person with other education or training, or to enable a person to access opportunities to work. And then obviously, you know, within those, um, I have a responsibility for monitoring certain services. So like I said, I won't get into more detail of this, but I have been engaging with the providers of services and I've already mentioned um, Victims and Survivors Service, um, who through their community partners, WAVE and Advice and I have engaged with 138 victims and survivors since their dedicated service um, came into being in December, 2020. As I said, when you look at victims and survivors as a community, um, one of the things that struck me most was the lack of research, public health research, population health research that's been carried out. And so in some ways we're providing services without an evidence base. And that contrasts perhaps with um, experiences in the Republic of Ireland and in Scotland. But nonetheless, we do know that there is, that victims and survivors do engage with both generalist service and specialist supports. And one of the services that I've been engaging with is Nexus Northern Ireland, specifically in relation to specialist supports for victims and survivors of institutional childhood abuse who experience sexual abuse in that context. Now, victims and survivors who were sexually abused have shared with me that this type of abuse can be among the most distressing and traumatizing of their experiences to recover from. And we know that, um, I think it was the PSNI did a paper in 2019 where they spoke about the presenting needs of victims of, histor of historical child abuse, rather than specifically institutional abuse. And they spoke about the increased, uh, the differences in victimology, the increased mental health needs and anxiety issues. So, you know, this is showing up in the system. Now, while Nexus does not have current data, um, in relation to numbers of victims of historical institutional childhood abuse victims. I'm very happy to say they have started collecting that data from the 1st of April. Due to increased resourcing, they have been able to reduce their current waiting list for services. However, that waiting list still stands at 745 people. And this may well increase again as Nexus has received over 900 referrals in relation to individuals in the last six months. Under those circumstances, I'd be concerned that the victims of historic institutional childhood abuse who'd experienced sexual abuse may not be able to receive specialist supports that they need in a timely manner. And I would suggest that, you know, if we're actually looking at providing appropriate services to victims and survivors, that we give due regard to this. The services I've spoken to are endeavouring to carry on supporting victims and survivors in the midst of COVID restrictions. They are frustrated, as are the victims and survivors themselves. Some victims and survivors are finding the current lockdown measures really difficult. It is impacting on their mental health. It's reminding them of their confinement as children. And to that end, I've spoken with mental health champion Siobhan O'Neill about the need for trauma-informed mental health services in relation to victims of historical institutional childhood abuse. 
We know that the majority of victims and survivors, and this is based on the Victims and, Support and Survivors Service, fall into the late 50s and upwards age categories. And we know that ageing is itself a factor for increased physical and mental health issues. And that these combined with the trauma of childhood institutional abuse means that victims and survivors will potentially require additional specialist and general services as they get older. And I think this is something that's really important for services in Northern Ireland to understand and engage with, that the needs of victims and survivors of historic institutional childhood abuse are only set to grow and they will present in general services. Um, in my submission to the consultation on the draft mental health strategy, I underlined the need for general health services to be trauma-informed, not only from a troubles perspective, but also in the context of institutional childhood abuse. Um, I would hope that the eventual finalised mental health strategy would be informed by these observations in relation to historic institutional childhood abuse. And I suppose to conclude, and to thank the committee for giving me um, the extensive time that you have. Since I last spoke with the committee, like I said, I have had the opportunity to engage more with victims and survivors. And I've heard of their experiences more as children and the abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, and overall neglect that they endured. Some people would describe this abuse as unimaginable, but for victims and survivors, they don't have to imagine it because they lived it. And for many of them, they're living with the effects of that abuse every day. One elderly lady shared with me how she used to run up to a fence when she was in the institution and wave just so at passers-by, just so that she could believe that she was still here, that someone could see her, that she wasn't, that she hadn't been filed away. And I think that image of that child running up to that fence to wave at us, to say, I'm still here, even in the midst of horrendous accounts of abuse, and I could share those with you, but you've heard them, but each is unique to each individual victim and survivor. To think of that little girl waving at us and saying, I'm still here, recognize me, see me. To me, I think that's probably going to be the most enduring image that I have going forward. One of the greatest sources of anger and frustration shared with me by victims and survivors, some victims and survivors, has been the lack of systemic accountability for the abuse perpetrated on them as children. For many, as I said, they've endured a lifetime of their abuse being denied, minimized or ignored. And I've heard more than once, genuinely, where's the justice? Who's going to be held responsible? Like, you know, for many, they want justice and accountability for their abuse. However, from their perspective, they're seen, they've seen little of it by way of accountability. Now, one of the things that I've undertaken to do is... Um, I have written to the Public Prosecution Service with a range of queries, okay, asking around their treatment of historic and institutional childhood abuse cases. I've also um, written to the Minister for Justice, Naomi Long, and we're due to meet, and she equally expressed her concern around these cases. You know, I think at the very least, victims and survivors are owed a full account and explanation of how their abuse has been treated how their cases have been processed. And to be given that explanation and that respect, I think that's really important. So I look forward to sharing with you the results of that initial query. I'm also hoping to speak with the PSNI regarding their experience of dealing with historic institutional childhood abuse cases. Um, I suppose just a couple of other concluding remarks. Um, redress. Um, I think I offered to you on the 18th of March that redress is more than just the administration of legal compensation. It can be more productively understood as part of a reparations framework on the part of the state to victims and survivors who are being asked to trust the state again. Victims and survivors experience in this process signals to them how they're being viewed by the state. And this latter consideration has implications for other parts of the historic institutional childhood abuse reparations framework that the state may undertake, including informing the context of a formal apology to victims and survivors. I suppose in relation to apology, um, the Heart Inquiry noted that there were many different opinions in relation to an apology among victims and survivors. Some victims and survivors want an apology and some do not. And there are shades of opinion in between. 
I've had one lady again say to me, you know, all I ever wanted was someone to say sorry to me. I've had someone else say to me, I don't care what way they say sorry, they can never make up for what was done to me as a child. And they are both legitimate points of view to have. I mean, they are the, the expressed view of two victims and survivors. And I think they're both, you know, none, none of us have the right to say that there's one is more legitimate than the other, you know. But nonetheless, you know, there is an intention to go ahead with a state apology. And I know that the executive office have been working um, in relation to proposals. I envision my role in this process to be an advocate for victims and survivors and to ensure that their voices are heard and their interests are central to any undertaking that may occur. And I'd offer again to the committee, whatever apology process is undertaken, what needs to be considered is that this is more than just a statement in a given place at a given time. Based on the experiences of other jurisdictions in other highly sensitive areas, you know, it could be anticipated that we will have corresponding systemic implications in the run-up to an apology and afterwards. And when I say that, what do I mean? I'm talking about increased potential for um, we, for victims and survivors to apply for redress. We're talking about increased associated demand for services, services that we know are already stretched, that have existing waiting lists. So I think if we're going to go ahead with an apology, you know, obviously when we go ahead with an apology, there needs to be due regard given to victims and survivors' experiences in other parts of the system, including redress and including you know, what services are available, what help is available to them, because there will be a before, a during and an after to this. But fundamentally, what we have to realise at every stage is that victims and survivors need to be central to it. Um, that's it, I think, for me for the moment. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for that very comprehensive report. It is appreciated. I think you've probably answered many of the questions that members will have um, uh, in terms of um, covering off the, the areas that are most important. Um, I sort of was struck by that by feeling that, you know, that, you know, referencing that sort of for those that have been impacted, the state really let them down as children and um, it took a little for them when they were growing up. And I just hope that through your work and through the interest that the committee takes and in fairness, the interest that I know that there is from the executive office to try uh, and pursue this and move this agenda on. I hope that that can, to those victims, maybe highlight that there is the support, the concern, uh, and the understanding now that there maybe hasn't been in the past. And, and I know that they have every reason not to have faith in state um, authorities and and uh, individuals, but I know certainly your work and our work is, is, is on the side of the victim, and, and we will continue to address that. Um, I know we had some interactions and I think the interactions that we have had as a committee and the meetings that we're having with some within the sector are probably dovetailing some of the meetings that you're having and the interactions that you're taking place. So I think a lot of our work is maybe being done in parallel, but we're not maybe aware of each other's work. So some of this uh, may already be dealt with by yourself, but there was a uh, considerable concern um, from the redress board uh, about the involvement with the redress board but it was very specific not so much the establishment of it or the way to progress through it or what the outcomes of it would be but very much about just the human approach people felt that they were almost being violated again uh, in their interactions because it was so legalistic um, and that you know that these people need to you know they can't be treated as a mechanism within a legal process they are individuals that have been terribly badly hurt uh, and that we need to try and work very sympathetically and very sensitively with them and there are other arms of the legal process um you know like existing cases maybe of of, of child abuse and maybe some rape cases etc where there is a very sensitive approach that is taken um by the authorities when working and i was just wondering if you could explain maybe some of the work that you've had in terms of of trying to get the redress board to be just softer in how they approach matters and, and understanding that, yes, there is a legal process, but it doesn't mean that you have to go about it in a legalistic way. Has that been a challenge or is that been something that's being identified and maybe some resolutions being found? 
That's an excellent question, Colin, and it deserves um, a comprehensive answer. Um, yes, it has been a challenge. If I could just say one thing, I don't think it's asking the redress board to take a softer approach. I think it's asking it to put victims and survivors center for process. And I actually don't think that's a center or it's a soft approach at all. I think it's actually what makes, you know, highly efficient services deliver what they're supposed to do. And so what I've been actively encouraging the redress board to do is to use its first year anniversary as an opportunity to reflect, to reach out, to engage with victims and survivors, to undertake a review process. Because how do you know what the experience is of a victim and survivor if you never actually engage with a victim and survivor? The process is set up to go from victim and survivor to solicitor to redress board in that linear order redress board then comes back to solicitor, solicitor comes back to victim and survivor. And at no stage does the victim and survivor get to actually engage with the redress board itself. And I think it's that understand, it's a fundamental difference in how you conceptualize the redress process. Whether you regard it as a kind of a cold legalistic process, or do you understand it that it's part of a wider reparations framework on the part of the state to victims and survivors and that every engagement they have with that, with that process signals to them how they're being regarded. I mean, for, for a victim and survivor to engage with the application process takes an enormous leap of faith and courage. You know, to even lift the phone to ask. And like, I've heard the phone calls. You know, this is not me hearing the second hand. I've seen, I've seen victims and survivors as they go through this process. And many are also desperate to be able to share their experiences and say, this is what it was like. This is what happened to me. I mean, that's in the course of the process, but also on a very basic level. You know, I mean, you know yourself, if you're involved in a process or a situation and you don't know how long it's going to take, you don't know exactly, you might have an idea what you're at, but you don't quite fully know what that means. You know, it exacerbates your anxiety and stress. And what we're talking about is trying to encourage a victim and survivor centered approach to incorporate almost retrospectively, it's like reverse engineering, a co-design approach to the redress process. And to say that victims and survivors need to be central to it, their experiences, concerns, questions need to be taken on board and proactively engaged with. I don't know if that answers the that no, some way. And I think there is an opportunity, and I, th I, I like that you've identified that there's an opportunity maybe in the first anniversary that it kind of, there's a neat fit to say we're one year in, let's look back at what we've done, let's look at how we can get improved going forward, and then also saying look, there was an obvious gap of including that co-design process, so let's, let's include that now. So I think that's something of value, and maybe we uh, as a committee could maybe think of, of ways to write and request that that review um, takes place. Now, the, the other issue you mentioned, I suppose, um, the apology, and I suppose I'm struck, I, I, I get the point about the two different approaches, and one that maybe would say, I don't care what they would say in terms of an apology, it will never do. And others saying that actually that's all that they want. And I suppose it maybe if almost could work there and saying, well, the, the, the apology is necessary then because those that want to dismiss it can dismiss it, but those that want it can get it. But if it's there, um, so I suppose maybe the pursuing of that apology is, uh, is something that would be important because... Um, to some people, that, that may uh, be, be something that they have looked for and something that they want to see. The other element that was mentioned as well was about a memorial uh, of some description. Could you give us a wee flavour just maybe of what you've been doing on that front over the last period of time? Well, I think just to pick up on your apology comments, um, what I'm sharing here with the committee is nothing new. I mean, Judge Anthony Hart recorded that um, spectrum of opinion around apology in his um, recommendations and report, you know, that there was a spectrum of opinion. But I do think it has enormous symbolic value for many people. And I think, you know, if we ensure that we incorporate, say, core principles, I'm thinking of Professor Anne Marie McAlinden's work at Queen's University, where she established core principles about what makes a good apology, that we put those in place, you know, into a form an apology. If we understand that it's actually a multi-stakeholder initiative. And I mean, I've said fundamentally to the executive office, 
that my role is to be an advocate for victims and survivors in this process to ensure their interests are central and their voices are heard. But fundamentally, this is for the state and the institutions to apologize to victims and survivors. You know, so I think we need to keep that in mind. And a third element I would say is that while it's easy for, if you're not involved in all this, to silo it and go, well, that's the apology, that's redress, that's services. If you actually stop looking at that and put yourself in the position of the victim and survivor and say, okay, I experienced abuse as a child in, in, in an institutional context, okay, using very cold language. I'm looking for help and support. Maybe I need that help and support while I'm applying for redress. And at the same time, if my experience, I can't get sufficient help and support for, say, particular abuse, my experience of redress is really frustrating. It's anxiety provoking. And then I'm in the context of someone apologizing to me. For that apology to be real, we better make sure that redress is, you know, as positive a process as it can be for a victim and survivor, and that those support services that are needed that are there. Otherwise, it would be my view that an apology is going to come across as being quite hollow if we don't understand that it occurs in a much wider context. Regarding memorial, um, obviously the Hart report made um, a number of recommendations um, regarding memorial. I think it was envisaged that there would be a physical memorial, that it would be commissioned by the Arts Council. Um, again, there is a spectrum of opinions around memorial or what should take place. Um, I think, again, I would go with first principles. You know, I mean, Judge Hart did set out um, a recommendation for a memorial. I think whatever happens, we need to ensure that victims and survivors have their views are integral to whatever process is undertaken and whatever outcome emerges. I don't always think that it's a case of it just needs to be one thing. It can be an and rather than either or. I don't know if that helps at all in any way. Just if you want to thank you those responses there. It's, and it's good to know that in the five months that you've been providing. Four so months. Four months, even such a detailed report just gives us some comfort to the amount of uh, the way you've immersed yourself in, in the work so far. I, I'm going to pass to Beatty now, who is the Deputy Chair, and ask him for, for his questions. Go on ahead, Doug. Thank you, Chair. Um, Fiona, thank you uh, so much for, for that um, update. I mean, it's really enlightening, uh, and you've raised dozens of questions now, and I'm not going to get them all in, unfortunately, so I'm just going to maybe try and narrow them down a little bit. Uh, the first thing I can say is, and I, and I know the chair will agree with me in this, is that there is now a real, really good working relationship building up between certainly myself and the chair and the various different groups out there, be that Margaret McGookin or or Jerry McCann or or or, or John um, at Survivors Northwest. Uh, I, I mean, it it's really is a good relationship building up and a friendship and a, and a trust. Uh, and just on that um, point, if I if I can, um, Fiona, uh, I was speaking to to, uh, to to Mags, and she's saying that uh, the redress board president in uh, Huddleston still has not met uh, their group yet. Um, do you know if he's planning to do that soon, or is there any way we can shuffle him along a little bit? I think that um, there had been um, a date put forward, but. Um, that arrangements perhaps hadn't quite been fulfilled but i would i understand that there would be goodwill to go ahead with that meeting and i'm happy i mean i'm obviously you know you mentioned john jerry margaret there are other victims and survivor group representatives as well who i would be in contact with and you know it's really important that we make sure that those communications are open and building up and that um you know i would imagine i'm happy to speak with the redress board again but my understanding is that there had been an initial meeting offered for that um the states hadn't worked out yeah it should it'd just be really good to get it done um i think absolutely you know, I, I think engagement is a real positive here uh, and I, I mean i'm struck by some of the things you've said you know that just that waving story really sort of gripped me a little bit can i just ask about the redress board um mm. and, and put me right if i've got this wrong but that's now been increased to three panels sitting yes. three days a week can, can i ask a, a a a really basic question why can't it be three panels five days a week? Oh, Doug. Um, 
That's a really good question. I think basically it's to do with availability, it's to do with turnaround. Perhaps a, a, an ancillary question would be, why not more redress panels? If they, if they can only sit three days a week, has the opportunity been explored to bring more online? And I think that goes back to my comment. You know yourself, again, if you're providing services, okay? You constantly sit down, and I mean, I say this as someone who provided services for seven years, frontline services with 1,200 missions a year to the organization that I ran. Um, you sit down, you forecast, and you say, well, look, we expect if this happens, we expect, you know, an extra 100, 500, you know, um, cases to come before us. So what plans are there in place, you know? for engaging to bring other redress panels online. To be fair to the redress board, they have said one of the issues that they're engaging with, and I'm sure they've said the same to you, is um, the level of applications that they're receiving, that some are incomplete. And they have said to me that they're going to address that aspect in relation to a CPD event, continuing professional development event through the Law Society. And I think that's wonderful, that's great. But that only takes care of part of it. One of the things that I've advocated for, and I've asked the redress board is, what is your case management process? Are you actively case managing? Are you triaging your waiting lists so that if someone is on for 10 months or 11 months on that waiting list, that they can actually, you know, be selected and picked out? And this is like, this is done with waiting lists all the time in health and social care. So it's to proactively case manage, triage, for looking at those cases that are on longest. We know they do it for people who are over 70. We know they do it for people who have um, grave sickness. But at the same time, what about that group of individuals, of victims and survivors that don't fit into either category who have been in the system for nearly 10 months? What? And so I've made some recommendations. We're looking forward to having ourselves a meeting with the redress board to work out some of these issues, you know, and to explore them. But again, I think it's imperative, Doug, that the experience, the current lived experience of victims and survivors as they go through the redress process is incorporated, you know, and what they're saying to us is yeah, we're waiting yeah. too long. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, Fiona, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, part of that, you know, is that direct engagement piece that that, that I think is a, is really useful too. If if we could maybe try and you know be able to push aside a, the solicitor side of things or the legal piece and and have so, some sort of direct in, in engagement, but I'm just really struck, feeling about by by where we are now and the numbers you're predicting that we could be doing this for ten years, and I just cannot imagine people sitting at the back of a queue waiting for 10 years, that, 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 that is nearly putting them where they would give up hope, especially if they're older people, you know, giving up, giving up hope. And the last thing you want to do uh, is, is get people to give up hope in, in regards um, to this process. And I know you will, you will force that issue. And, you, and I think you're right, you know, one year in, there is a chance to do a scrub of the system we have and, and change it to make it work better. You know, nothing is uh, should ever be set in stone if we can do it a little better. And I think that will be a pretty useful thing to do. I think Fiona, if if that's possible, and you can you can do that. I guess I on think the you can, Doug. I think you can. Yeah, and, I mean, and it I may think... require changes. I mean, and you know, it may every review. If it requires changes, then let's make sure the impetus and goodwill is in the system to facilitate those changes. But it's never too late to incorporate um, victim and survivor centered approaches, trauma-informed approaches. And just be very careful because I don't want to misconstrue. I mean, I would be, I would never suggest that there was, you know, a substitute for expert advice, legal advice from a solicitor. That's not what we're talking about. When we're talking about direct engagement, it's to allow someone to be able to have a choice, to ask, where am I in the process? How long is it going to take? Well, this is, I mean, this is what I really want to get across. This is useful for the redress board itself. Anyone who's provided a service around a business knows how can you improve? How can you know what you're doing? And if you're doing it well, if you don't engage with the people who are actually providing the service too. And I, and I think, you, you, I mean, with us, I know for a fact, we, with this committee, you're pushing on an open door. Uh, right. I mean, we really need the, the executive to really lean into to, to this one. I, I'm not going to go on to the apology and the memorial piece anymore. I, I think the chair ha, has covered that and I think you've answered it pretty well. I suppose for, for people out there who want to see that apology and that memorial of whatever form it's going to be, it's just 
the when is always going to be their question. You know, 2019, now 2021, when is it going to happen? But don't, you don't need to answer that, um, Fiona. I'm really conscious on time here. But can I just ask something you raised? And you know what? To my shame, I've never really thought about it. And that's this accountability piece. Oh, yeah. How are we doing this accountability piece? I mean, we have talked and argued at great length um, throughout the, the executive and further afield about how we deal with legacy issues and accountability in regards to that. And this seems to have slipped a little bit down the pecking order. And I'm on the Justice Committee, um, uh, and, and it doesn't seem to be something that, that, that is high up there talking about this. But if, if we're looking at this in an accountable way, if we're putting law first, and there's evidence to, 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 to bring somebody to account in regards to this, then surely we must be doing that. And therefore, there must be an action plan within you know, the Department for Justice or somewhere to be able to, to tackle this particular issue. I think, Dilk, it's a great observation. And I think it's really important that, as you rightly say, that is, this is understood as a justice issue. You know, I mean, we ha I have had victims and survivors come to me. And just to put this into perspective, and I know we're pressed for time, when you have a grown man saying to you, I'm afraid to step inside a certain town in case I meet the guy who abused me. Yeah. And that's a grown man saying this to you. And the, the shame of him expressing this to you, that he is ashamed that he is saying this. You know, I mean, how hard is it for him to have to face this? And so that's why I've started trying to get together an evidence base by asking the PPS, what are you doing? By asking the PSNI, there are some references in the Gillen report as well, obviously, and those the, the specifically relate to um, child sexual abuse, which could have relevance for historical institution abuse. So it is something that I would like to be able to pursue with yourselves and with the, and with the Justice Committee in the same way as the need for services to be trauma informed from a historic institutional childhood abuse perspective needs perhaps to be pursued with the health committee. You know, the system needs to become aware. I think you also need to understand there's a very specific nature to these crimes. They are exceptional crimes. They are crimes that the victim may not even have had full memory of. And as they grow older, they may be, have recovered memories. It is the nature of trauma. And if we don't understand that, then we're letting them down again. We're getting, leaving that little girl who waved from the fence down again. Yes, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm absolutely with you in this. I mean, if we are sitting here as a society and say justice is blind, it must deal with issues, then it has to, issue, it has to deal with them uh, in the round. And just because there's a lot of people, just because it's complicated, doesn't mean we can package it, put it in a box and forget about it. We're going to have to address this, uh, and and this is this is going to be an important piece, I think, moving on from from, from here. But listen, um, thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. That was really useful. Thanks very much for that, Doug. Okay, I'm going to move on now, and if I could ask for um, Pat Sheehan and then Martina Anderson. So, Pat, do you want to come in there? Thank you, Chair, and and thanks very much for that comprehensive overview, Fiona. And yeah. um, yeah. you've Sorry, sorry. Yes, go on ahead. Go on ahead. You're okay. Uh, you've you've answered most of the questions that I already had, and and one of the main ones was about direct access uh, for the victims to the the redress board. Um, but I want to touch on a couple of the issues that that Doug also raised there, and and you raised in your your opening commentary. And first of all, the lack of systemic accountability. And, and, and of course, that exists in this case, but it's not unique to this case. I mean, we're dealing here uh, currently with an, a number of, of issues around abuse. You take, for instance, the abuse of very vulnerable patients with learning uh, uh, disabilities in Muckamore. Yeah. Um, we had the hyponatremia scandal. We have another issue around um, in neurology. Uh, patients. You've had similar scandals in the South with cervical smear scandal and, and, and others, you know. Uh, and unfortunately, in most of these cases, while individuals may be held to account uh, and brought before the courts for, for what they have done, uh, 
Often we find that there's no accountability for those who were responsible for overseeing and supervising what was happening. And the fact is, it's just part of the human condition where power is put in the hands of individuals over other individuals, particularly vulnerable individuals. Uh, invariably, we get abuse of that power, and it may be physical abuse, it may be sexual abuse or, or, or whatever. But it seems to be that there's never accountability uh, for those who had uh, oversight or managerial or supervisory responsibility. And I'm wondering, would you like to comment on that? I think that's incredibly insightful, part of you. You know, I mean, the reality is we know that systems close in to protect themselves. And that could be anything from church abuse to, you know, Hollywood scandals, the Me Too movement. We know that the system will seek to protect those in power and to deny or minimize or, you know, ridicule the complainant, the victim and survivor. I think the question for us is, if you start with that recognition, which you are, right, which is very insightful, then where do we go from there? How do we ensure that where we're at now doesn't happen again? And we do that, I think, by ensuring that we have robust oversight, that we have robust um, standards and procedures, and that we understand and this, I really can't stress this enough. And this is, I spent seven years providing services to victims, women and child victims of domestic abuse and sexual violence. So I really can't stress this enough. It's important that one part of the system knows what the other part of the system is doing and that there are shared standards because this is about protecting. We don't repeat the mistakes of the past going forward. We ensure we put in those core principles that there is oversight, that there is review. That's what I would offer in response to you. Okay. Thanks for that. And and I also take on board your critique of the, the legislation and so far as the lack of, of, co of a co-design process within it. And I suppose I, I don't want to be here making excuses for the, for the legislation that came forward, uh, but I would agree with the chair's suggestion that we communicate with the, the redress board in an attempt to uh, co-design how they process uh, all of the applications in a way that is victim-centered uh, and, and, and deals with, with the victims and survivors in all of this uh, uh, process. And also on the, the issue of services. And it's, again, it's disturbing, but... Uh, I suppose not unexpected that there actually isn't an evidence base of of what type of services uh, that are required, uh, and and we find this. And uh, I mean, I've already mentioned the neurology scandal here, and literally hundreds of patients having been misdiagnosed, and many who are traumatized after you know, living with a, a misdiagnosis for maybe 10, 15, 20 years and how that has affected their lives. Uh, some women told they were unable to have children uh, uh, as a result and now being past childbearing age, you know. So all, all, all of those problems and there are no proper services in place to deal with the trauma that all of those patients have suffered. Uh, so, I mean, again, uh, we 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 need to, uh, I suppose, develop an evidence base around all of these scandals that take place. And I suppose it's an indictment on all of us that that process, in, in a sense, hasn't really begun, or certainly it hasn't gained as much traction as is required to deal with the the victims and survivors of all of these particular scandals. So, I mean, there's no question in there. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving that as uh, as my own opinion. And, and I want to thank you uh, for the work you're doing. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. For that, um, could I ask them for Martina to be brought in? Go on ahead, Martina. Um. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Fiona. Um, Fiona, you know, listening to you, um, I almost feel overwhelmed. 
um, I, I really have felt very affected by the um, the information that you give to us because to think that we don't have a, a trauma informed and aware process because th that just should be at the heart of this and despite perhaps best efforts uh, on the, on behalf of those in the redress board in terms of the operation of the redress board it certainly needs reviewed after listening to you today there is no doubt in my mind that uh, that needs to change because we cannot have a situation that we as a scrutinizing committee and we know the projected figure of 5,000 applications with only what you told us today, 506, um, being having reached their final determination. So the rate of progression needs speeded up. It needs to increase. And this is happening on our watch. You know, when we talk to, and I should declare an interest as someone who was a junior minister who was involved in setting up the inquiry to, of the historical institution abuse. And I was talking to many victims and I'm aware of how powerless that they have felt in the past. I had hoped that this process, that this redress um, was going to find them with wraparound support and a degree of comfort and acknowledgement. And as I listen to you, you know that they feel powerless again, that they're being traumatized again that they're being let down again. And that's happening on our watch now. So Chair, I think what, what Doug has said about the engagement that yourself and Doug is having with Margaret and John McCourt and Jerry and others, um, I would request that the committee in full, that we have them in front of the committee in some form so that we get to also hear collectively and that the public get to hear collectively from the victims. Because what, what Fiona is telling us today, and Fiona um, picking up what Pat said and Doug said, and, and I believe the chair as well, about the need for um, a point of contact. But a point of contact for victims that is victims and survivors centered, that it's a point of contact that is trauma-informed and an aware uh, person that has been trained in that field uh, so that the individuals uh, feel that they're not they're not being counters, they're not part of something that's happening to them somewhere else that they have no communication with. So, um, Fiona, in terms of that point of contact, how do you envisage that could work? Because it, it obviously doesn't exist, but how would you envisage it working and working well? Well, I think, first of all, Martina, again, you know, it's I'd imagine your comments are going to be enormously reassuring for victims and survivors. And I suppose to also comment that, you know, there are victims and survivors who've gone through the redress process who are probably happy with what has happened. But even if one or two people aren't, we still need that. And it's about establishing a victim centered trauma informed approach at the very heart of the redress process, because I think what you rightly picked up on is this is part of a much larger framework. And every time someone engages, there is, it's signaling to them, here's how you think about me. Here's how the state treats me. So I think at the first instance that it is worth doing a review and that any review that is undertaken needs to incorporate speaking with victims and survivors who've been through the redress process and asking about their experiences. And then we build from there. We don't just preempt it. But I suppose at the very least, you'd be looking at, and this sounds really simplistic, so I apologize if it sounds really simplistic, but it's about having exactly the people that you're talking about inside the redress, redress board, having a group of individuals, a unit, whatever you want to call it, that can talk to victims and survivors and say, well, look, normally this might take eight weeks, might take 14 weeks, here's where you are, here's what this means. It may take longer, but... You know, to be able to explain, to put a human face, because as it stands at the redress board now, the board may never actually come in contact with a victim and survivor. They may never actually see someone's face. They may never hear someone's voice. And like from what you said about what your understanding was, this redress process would have a, an added um, benefit for victims and survivors. 
certainly you can get an award and there are awards being made, although people would have queries as well about levels of award. But fundamentally that, can I put it, I don't want to say symbolic because that sounds soft, but that meaningfulness, that's what we're talking about, a meaningful experience of engaging with the redress board. I don't know that that exists right now. It certainly doesn't sound uh, like it exists at all. And um, and unfortunately for those who have had the lived horrendous experience, it is those people who need to be in the room as part of that review. Yeah. So those with that lived experience uh, will be involved in the shaping of the interaction and exchange. I find it uh, disappointing to say the least that what you said about one in eight uh, of those victims who live in Britain and what they have to encounter. You know, that they may have their redress uh, deducted from their housing benefit, from their social security benefits, that it could be taxed. I just find that shameful at every level. And the fact that our executive is having to try and engage with, uh, with the British minister or the work and pension minister then again, I find that unacceptable. And again, Chair, I think that this is the this, this issue and many others, this is the common ground that we all share in this committee. And we need to be taking the information that Fiona has imparted to us today. We know that the executive ministers may understand and have actually made an approach uh, with regards to this, but it's simply not good enough that this kind of, in some ways, penny pension from those people who have went through hell in their life and who are trying to survive uh, may find or, or will find because they are living in Britain, because they don't want to come back here because of perhaps that experience. Uh, that, and, and, and of course they have, you know, they're living in Britain and, and that's where they now reside, that they um, are being somewhat punished because they live in another jurisdiction and therefore uh, it's taxed or the, the, what was agreed in relation to here is not applying there. Um, I find that offensive. I find it not acceptable. And it's something that I think that this committee needs to, to take forward um, and, and be more robust um, and we're highlighting all of these issues. So Fiona, look, thank you again um, for so working hard to it today. You're welcome. Okay, Martina, thank you. I know you, you need to, to go shortly and, and thank you for, get, for getting sorted. I was going to say I could see Paul had his coat on there as well. So <laughs> he's rushing you towards that door, so he is. So we don't want to, to, to hold back. I, I don't have any indications from anybody else, but I know sometimes the, the indications don't work. So I'm just going to, to, to give an opportunity. Is there any other member there that wants to ask a question? Um, yes, okay. Emma, go ahead. We'll go to Emma and then we'll come to Trevor. Thank you very much, um, and thanks to Fiona oh, for the presentation. Hello? Uh, sorry, we'll just pause you. Emma, Trevor, Clark, you have your mic on there. If you could just mute yourself and we'll get you in a wee moment. And uh, go on ahead, Emma. Apologies, I wasn't sure what that was. Uh, no, Fiona, I just want to thank you for the... For the the conversation thus far and a lot of the questions that you've answered and obviously this is a long and arduous process and so so sensitive and I know we've discussed that at different times when you've been before the committee before. Um, what I wanted to ask um, was around obviously you've you've commented on the discrepancies around the waiting time and how that can further traumatise people that have been through this awful experience. Around and, and what um, involvement you have had with people when they are trying to access public funding and services that are impacted by their experience. And I'm thinking around interaction with the housing executive and people being expected to provide proof of this abuse or proof that it has been reported. And obviously where you know, that is additional trauma for people and all the, the issues that we can see arising out of drug and alcohol dependency. I know that I've worked with constituents who have had this sort of abuse or have had an experience and when they're trying to access services they can sometimes be put through the ringer again i just wondered if if you had any dealings um around that and, and what your experience has been thus far um emma thank you for that to be frank with you um we haven't had experiences particularly around accessing housing but what you do raise is a really really interesting um and I think pertinent 
observation because it's something that I brought up with the mental health champion, Professor Siobhan O'Neill. It's, you know, if I'm going for health services, I may not necessarily want to disclose that I'm a victim of institutional childhood abuse. I mean, you know, because we know that every time a victim and survivor has to recount or maybe share, you know, it can be potentially re-traumatizing. And at the very most basic level, how would you like to go going for housing? Or I was going for housing and someone says, I'd like you now to disclose to me the worst period of your life. And could you give me some details on that? Because, you know, um, I think that underlines the need for a trauma-informed approach to services. And that basically, that you almost, and one of the, it is one of the principles of the trauma-informed service provision, that you understand that you accept as a given that trauma is present and that it may be present without necessarily requiring the individual to go into detail. Um, I think obviously under legislation, I have a specific remit around encouraging provision of service and monitoring certain services. So certainly, you know, we're willing, my office is willing to engage on these issues. We haven't specifically to date, but I would offer that, you know, all, all state services engaging with victims and survivors need to be trauma informed. A part of that trauma informed is understanding and accepting that trauma is a given without necessarily having to make someone an exception to be able to avail of their rights or service. Thanks, Fiona. Chair, if I could just make, make one more. I know that um, in the, in particularly in the written briefing, there was commentary around the fact that victims who are now resident in Britain are having problems with the award having an impact on any other benefits that they may be claiming and the whole sort of means tested um, aspect to, to, to our welfare system and, and how th these these payments shouldn't be considered and the problems that that then leads to. And I'm thinking as well, I know I've dealt with a case recently where, with someone who was pre-settled status and then no access to, to public funds and then the impact that that had and it had implications for, for housing. And all of this, I suppose, is around the... it's. It's sort of the, the result of us having a situation, the hostile environment, British Tory policy, which makes a person prove that they're ill, makes a person prove that they've went through a traumatic sort of um, experience before they can be, be dealt with with compassion. And I suppose that's just, you know, reading the testimony and obviously the waiting times and the panels and how often they're meeting and all of that. And it just, it's something that always strikes me that I hope that people are being taken at their word and, you know, that someone, when they're brave enough to come out and speak about their experience, that they're not then being, you know, sort of hauled over the coals and asked to, ask, you know, de dealt with, with contempt or suspicion and, and sort of been expected to prove that this happened. And we can see, obviously, the wording of the report, particularly in the 26 counties, that, you know, didn't take people's lived experience as fact. Um, and uh, that's more of a comment, I suppose, than anything else. I just, I'm very conscious that that it, it doesn't help um, people when, when, they, when they think they're going to be victim blamed almost. So thank you very much. And um, sorry for that. Could I, could I just add in very quickly? Again, I think you make a really good point here. Some victims and survivors have felt that the system is adversarial, that it is so really legalistic, that the burden of proof is once again put onto the victim and survivor that the institutions are almost removed from the process and their role is to provide information, that they're not being given a voice to voice their experiences, you know, to say, this happened to me. I was a child when this was done to me, you know? And I think it is, you know, having to put constantly the burden of proof onto victims and survivors, having to, you know, again, the institutions are oft, excuse me, <clears throat> are removed from this, you know? And like in many cases, they're being approached around um, obviously providing information. And we know that some information was very, very badly kept in the past. We know that record keeping and standards were at different levels. And that's enormously anxiety provoking and stressful for victims and survivors, you know? So I think you do raise a good point there. All right, thank you very much Emma for that. Um, Trevor Clark, did you have a question there? Well, first of all, I apologise, Chairman. I didn't realise my microphone was on. <laughs> One of the downsides to Zoom is um, you get temptation whenever you get a phone call to answer it. So the sooner we get back into the room, that temptation is removed. Um, 
I found this briefing useful, Chairman, but I suppose it takes me in a different place in the sense that we've now been a year of COVID. And one of the things I have enjoyed the most from the past was, and I mean, I've never, obviously this is a new service and it's up and running. Presentations is one thing, but actually, and I suppose I'm actually asking Fiona directly, if, if we could see a, a stage that we could come to her and see a work through of how the process is done. Once we can never feel what people are going through, I think we would get a better understanding of the process. Like presentations, I think sometimes just doesn't, and this is no reflection on, on Fiona or her team, but I think sometimes uh, presentations don't really reflect what it's really like. And I think the closest resemblance of that we could get is some sort of visit and you know, the committee to visit the service and get a work through on actually get a feel of what the process is really like, albeit none of us have that harrowing experience of the past. I think Trevor, it's important. First of all, thank you. And I think there is no substitute for, you know, literally walking the walk. But I suppose just to distinguish, as the Commissioner's Office, we have a range of duties and responsibilities set out under legislation. We're not actually a service provider per se, but we're happy to meet, and I've said this to Colin and Doug on numerous occasions, we're happy to meet with um, individuals from the committee, or with the whole committee itself, to have a conversation, a longer conversation, around the commissioner's remit and you know our role i think that's separate to the redress board which is actually a whole separate entity to um, the commissioner's office as you're well aware i mean the redress board actually reports into the department of justice it is a whole separate corporate entity our role is to monitor um, actually under legislation the role of the commissioner's office is to monitor the operation of the redress board promote the redress board and to actually provide general information and advice to applicants we're a non-departmental public body, so we have a totally separate relationship to the Redress Board. Perhaps based on your comments, you're actually, are you, I don't know, potentially, I'm just clarifying, are you looking at perhaps engaging with the Redress Board itself to talk about the applicant victims and applicants' experiences? Would that be right? Uh, yes, you are, I suppose, but in, in, ter in terms of both, I mean, this is a, it's been a long journey to get to the stage we're at in relation to getting the recognition, and I, I accept, yes, you're, it's probably more dressed at Redress Board, but, mm -hmm. but I think it's all of the one piece, in my mind, it's all one piece, because once we may look at them and how they do their work, it'll be also useful to see what your role is actually looking back at that as well, because it's all under that one umbrella. So, I mean, as I've said, we're, we're 12 months down the line in relation to COVID. Thankfully, things are getting back to normal. So I, I think the sooner we get to see this, because actually some of the points that Emma has made previously, I agree with. And one of the last things, and I actually did raise it in the House this week, and one of the last things we want to do is re-traumatise people going through your process. And I think there has to be some form of recognition to make this much easier for them and the process much easier. And I think the best way to, for us as individuals to get that understanding is actually to walk through the whole process um, from start to finish and even your, the interaction with your service with them. I'm happy to do so, and I think it's a great idea to have that holistic overview. So besides ourselves as the commissioner's office, whose primary duty is to advocate on behalf of victims and survivors, you would have the redress board who's there to obviously process redress applications from victims and survivors. But I think the, the third part of the triangle, Trevor, would be, say, the actual services provision, the services provided by the likes of the Victim Support Service by way of Trauma Centre. And I would also suggest a specialist service like Nexus and that for you, to get a full understanding of that um, holistic overview of, and starting with the victim and survivor, and I'm really passionate about this, that we start with the victim and survivor and we ask what is their journey through the different parts of the system? And I think if I understand you correctly, that's where you're going with this, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. And I think, yeah, Fiona, that's probably, the, the, there are many different elements to the process, but the one thing that's consistent is that the, the person, the victim that's actually going through that process. So taking on board what had been said by um, Retina earlier, meeting with them, uh, and if we can create the right environment for that event, because I don't think a, a committee presentation is maybe the best environment for, you know, giving that it can be quite daunting. We day and daily on the presentation <laughs> and, and think nothing of it. This is just another day at work for us. But those that are coming in where it's maybe something they're only doing once in their life or for some people once every so often, it maybe isn't just as straightforward and relaxed a process. So if we could get the right um, type of, of environment to actually meet up with, um, with some of those involved from the victims and, and survivors and actually listening to their story as they have progressed through it uh, might be useful. 
Um, I am conscious that we're, we've gone way over our hour, but there's still a few other members who may have questions. I'm just going to check with them. George, would you have something, any question there that you want to ask or check out? Okay, well, um, yeah, we can. Yes, go on ahead, yes. Uh, it's just to apologise for my lipness, uh, Chair. Um, I think Trevor has said everything that, that I, would, I would like to ask. And I support fully what, what Trevor has, has said. So I leave it at that, saying that um, time is moving on. But th thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then I'm just going to move across the screen. Next door to you is Christopher Stalford. Now, Christopher, do you have anything to? Uh, yes, just a, a more of a comment rather than um, uh, a question. As such, I want to thank Fiona for everything that she's said to us today. I think. Um, like Martina, I've been involved in this process from, from the start, back in the old um, OFM-DFM committee, and at times it has seemed nebulous and, and you know abstract concepts, but to actually see practical help being delivered to people is certainly um, what was envisaged, and uh, I'm really pleased that Fiona's in post and now able to crack up and, and get on with the work because... There are many of these people who are in the latter stages of their life, and it would be a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, if um, you know getting support and redress to them uh, was delayed any further. And therefore, I'm just so pleased to hear uh, what we have heard today. I want to actually just associate myself as well with the the comments that uh, Pat Sheehan has made in relation to people placed in positions of power and authority and the need to hold them to account. And I mean, the Assembly heard, um, I think it was yesterday, um, about what happens in terms of patient care when someone isn't held to account for their actions. Hundreds of people misdiagnosed. And it, abuses like that can happen in institutions, in government institutions, in public services, if we don't fulfil our function of holding people to account and speaking truth uh, to power. So uh, thank you, Fiona, for everything that you've said to us today. And it's really, really encouraging um, to see the progress that's being made because people have waited far, far, far too long um, for this. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. And finally, Trevor Long, I, I see if you're there with us. Have you any comments or any clarity needed there? Uh, well, I've only just joined, Chair, so I'll just apologise to Fiona, and um, I'm sorry I missed her presentation, but I was I was called to get my second job, so it's a good enough excuse for today. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. Very important, very important task that had to be done there, Trevor, and we're glad that you have that. So, um, look, Fiona, that's all the members um, that we that we've got through. Look, it's been very uh, comprehensive. We've got, we've got a lot of information. I want to thank you for your time and your preparation has gone in for the presentation today. I, I know that we will continue to, to have contact and to, to work alongside each other. And I've no doubt that, that sometime soon we may meet up in a different type of environment other than, than a, a, a Starleaf call and, and in terms of giving evidence and whatever. So we look forward to that in a maybe more informal basis of being able to catch up on the work. But thank you very much for your attendance here today. Um, You're we, very we, welcome. We, Thanks to the there. committee and thank yourself. You. Okay. Um, Members, maybe just there's a couple of outcomes that I uh, was trying to capture during that. Um, and one was maybe about this issue of the uh, review of the redress board, and that given that it's at its anniversary, um, I'll take guidance from, from, from anybody in terms of maybe how to do that. Is it direct to the Justice Committee and ask, or the Justice Minister, or uh, do we write to the ministers, Michael? Would you have any? guide there as to, to maybe how we could you know endorse or support that that um the, to take that opportunity of a review uh, and for it to be co-design based I'll, I'll, I'll check check with the data uh, to, just just to see where that letter should go okay um the other issue that was raised there was about those in living in britain and um obviously there uh, the impact of the payment that they may receive. We have addressed this previously, but just maybe somewhat superficially, as in we wrote and got a reply that it was being um, 
checked out. It was a an exchequer uh, business uh, uh, based issue over in London, and we were being told that that was being processed or progressed. Um, Michael, what would be a recommendation to follow up that? Will we go back and ask for an update on that and, and where we are? Uh, yes, Chad, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, I'm just throwing out ideas. If any other member has any other suggestion, just uh, jump in. Um, in terms of meeting with the sector, um, I know that we have that, myself and the vice president, have that meeting set at this stage. I think it's next week or the week, next fortnight or so. Would, would members be happy if we spoke to them at that stage and with other um, groups to find out a way that we can maybe get something on a Whenever I say informal, I don't mean that the outcomes will be any less uh, formalized, but maybe that we don't do it in an evidence-giving session. This is, but if, if that's what they want to do, we can do it. But if they would rather a more informal meeting, we can progress that. Doug, do you think that might be something that we could raise with them at that meeting? Yeah, I think it would be good, to, good, good, good point, Chuck, yeah. Yeah, okay. And I know we're not meeting all the groups at that stage, so we'll reach out to the other groups that we're not meeting at that stage as well, so um, we can do that. Well, look, members, um, unless there's any other issues that anybody wants to raise, if we conclude that session of the meeting, um, and maybe if we could take a, a few minutes of a break, just to give a comfort break maybe for five minutes, and then we'll see if we can get moved on to the uh, next session and Michael, maybe just to double check, I don't see anybody in the audience from the group that are presenting to us. Are they? She, she, she is, yeah. Uh, she, she is right in the audience, yeah. Oh, she is. I see. No, sorry, of course. Sorry. Top of the list of the audience, and, and, and I didn't see that. Sorry. Well, look, we'll just take a quick five minute break, and then we'll come back and move on to our next presentation. Thank you. Committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, so look, we're back again after that break. Thank you very much indeed, members. We'll move on to the next part of the agenda, which is item six, and it is a presentation from the Carnegie Trust. 
a UK trust about citizenship, citizen engagement and the programme for government. The papers are available for members there on pages 39 to 180 of the meeting pack. And we're very welcome, uh, very pleased to welcome Sarah Davidson, who is the Chief Executive Officer um, of Carnegie UK Trust to our meeting. Sarah, you're very welcome. Thank you for your attendance here today. I know that um, we, I'd met with representatives from yourselves back way back pre-Christmas um, and that we had a good conversation about some of the work that you were doing and some of the suggestions that you have for ways to improve the programme for government and improve governance. Uh, and I know that it was keen that the committee got an opportunity to hear that. So um, I'll pass over to yourself if you want to make um, a presentation for us and then what we can do is move to some questions and answers afterwards. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you so much. And uh, good afternoon to all members of the committee. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to brief you this afternoon. I know from looking at your work programme and indeed by hearing a little bit of the discussion before I joined you this afternoon, that you've got an extremely full agenda of very urgent items and that the programme for government is just one of those, albeit a very important one. So I'm therefore just going to say a few things by way of introduction and then I'll be very happy to respond to members' questions and discussion. As you may know, the Carnegie Trust has been connected with the development of the outcome-based approach in Northern Ireland since 2014. We also refer to this as a well-being approach and as a trust we've had over a decade of experience in studying and in supporting these approaches in quite a variety of places, both nationally and internationally as well as convening the original Carnegie Roundtable on measuring well-being in Northern Ireland back in 2014. We've also been working more recently since 2018 with local government and its statutory partners on the embedding of well-being at community planning level in Northern Ireland. And given that background and perspective, I think it's really important for me to say at the outset how very significant the 2016 draft programme for government was. By adopting that approach, Northern Ireland actually joined a growing number of governments right across the world in deciding to develop a vision for the future of their country and then using that vision as the guiding framework for the work of all their public services. I think it's fair to say that all those governments are still learning as they go and there's a growing body of experience therefore that Northern Ireland will be able to draw on and indeed contribute to yourselves over time. It's inevitable, probably, that the nature of the programme for government consultation puts the spotlight onto the technical detail at the level of specific draft outcomes and indicators. But I think it's also helpful to remind ourselves of the bigger context here as well. One of the distinctive things that characterises the Northern Irish experience is the fact that the original work on a wellbeing approach was seen as being particularly helpful in a post-conflict society where a shared vision and a shared set of outcomes could assist a power sharing executive in working together. And it occurs to me that it may be that there's something in that foundational thinking which could usefully be recaptured now, given the current challenges facing Northern Ireland, and expressed through executive ministers very visibly committing themselves collectively to the vision that's expressed in the outcome framework. Governments which commit to working with this focus on societal well-being are explicitly recognising that social progress is a multifaceted ambition, that you've got to keep your eye on social, economic, environmental and democratic outcomes all at the same time, and that no one of these should ever be allowed to dominate at the expense of the others. So while it might be tempting to regard the draft outcomes as kind of motherhood and apple pie, the important thing about them is that they cover all of that broad territory and that they are then actively used to guide decision-making about political choices and policy choices. As they are intrinsically about outcomes for everyone, they can also helpfully force attention onto inequalities within and between different population groups. And they're also really useful in providing a shared framework for collaboration between central government, its agencies, local government, and the social and community sector. We've been privileged to work with partners and friends in Northern Ireland on the development of this outcomes-based approach so far. And we truly believe that it has the potential to transform ways of working within the governance of Northern Ireland to the benefit of all its citizens. 
And for that reason, because we do believe in it, in our published response to the Programme for Government Consultation, we've identified six ways of working in the form of nine recommendations, which we think will help the executive make the shift from talking about a well-being approach to actually delivering and embedding it in practice. I think you've got a copy of that document. This is it here. Uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on the detail in my opening remarks, other than to say that we feel particularly strongly that the outcomes approach should be based on a statute, should be placed on a statutory footing. We believe that the requirement for new ways of working needs to be understood and embraced. And we believe that good quality citizen engagement will be absolutely essential to build understanding of and support for the work of the executive. And I'm more than happy to say more about any of these uh, and all our other recommendations in the course of our discussion today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Yes, and I mean, we've, um, I know we've seen the, the documentation that's in um, the committee papers and, and we've seen them before and they, they really do make um, excellent reading as a, as a framework for trying to provide and bring some practical um, life to programmes for government because I think the comments that you make um, about how, um, you know, the, the sort of grandma and apple pie approach that there can be, that, 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 that the programme for government can seem quite high level and who doesn't want to see better outcomes for their citizens, who doesn't want to have better um, start in life for, for children and young people and it really is drilling it down into the detail and I know that you've done um, a little bit of work on the, the concept of the, um, just get the terminology of it right, the uh, gross, gross domestic wellbeing strategy. Can you maybe discuss that a wee bit more for us on how a programme for government, how, how one can be embedded into the other and how that type of gross domestic wellbeing strategy could be used that we then would be be placing real targets to see are we actually improving um, the outcomes for citizens? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the thinking that goes into this notion of a wellbeing approach goes back really to the discussions about whether or not gross, dom gross domestic product, in other words, economic outcomes, economic growth, should be the primary focus for governments. And I think the recognition over a long time that if you focus solely on economic growth at the expense of your social, environmental and democratic outcomes, it doesn't have overall good outcomes for society. And um, one of the things that we recognize in relation to that is that over time, this notion of GDP is something that you can measure and you can talk about and you can uh, track progress in has led to it having a really kind of overweening impact in the public mind. If you think about you know, the number of times that you hear a headline on the news about a change in GDP, and yet actually many people, when asked about what matters to them in life, would not simply talk about economic growth. Of course, it of course it is an important thing, and it's connected to jobs and uh, uh, and so on. But it's not the only thing. So the work that we have done on uh, gross domestic well-being has been an attempt to try and rebalance this focus on economic growth with an alternative focus. And the way we did that, and this was particularly focused on England, was to take the uh, Office for National Statistics basket of indicators that measure well-being and to try and pull out of that an index that would enable us to track progress on well-being in the same way that you can tra track progress on, uh, on, on GDP. And that basket of indicators is made up of a mixture of subjective and objective uh, uh, indicators, both about how people feel about the place they live, how they feel about their own well-being, but also objective indicators like education attainment, like environmental quality and so on, which collectively could reasonably say, be said to say something about the well-being of, of a nation. And I think the important point about those, which connects back to the work in, in Northern Ireland and the Emerging Outcomes Framework, is that these are not things which are amenable to changing over a period of months or even, even probably over the lifetime of one executive. They are long-term outcomes and the indicators that you measure alongside them, indeed like GDP, are long-term indicators. And that's why we think it's really helpful for them to sit actually at a level above individual programmes for government so that the conversation with an individual executive is not about what the outcomes should be once they've been established, but it's about what is any one executive going to do at any point in time 
to try and achieve those outcomes. And of course, those are those are politically those are political choices, and different people will have different views about the ways in which you do that. But the indicators enable you to track that over time. Thank you for that. And I suppose two two thoughts come into my mind during that. One is that if we look back over the past and the pandemic, how the emphasis for many people will have moved away from GDP because they haven't, you know, okay, there, there may be um, income that's happening, but they're not working and they're actually reevaluating what the important things in life are and about the interactions that they have with families and the interactions that they've missed. Um, so there has been a um, maybe a critical set of eyes looking back on our on our life and our approach to, to life in the past year, which may be an ideal opportunity to start saying, how do we measure the outcomes of what our government is doing should it purely be in something like a GDP and maybe moving to something else and maybe on a more uh, simple basis I was reflecting this morning on another conversation that I was having and I would have been taught the, 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 the sense of the task and maintenance forms of leadership and how maybe the GDP is the task but this, um, you know, well-being is maybe the measurement of maintenance. It's how we maintain ourselves as people, how we as human beings interact with our life and our livelihoods and our uh, those communities around us and, and the goodness that we get from that. But to, to jump um, maybe for my second question then, there was reference um, from yourselves about a citizens' advisory uh, panel. So it was just like, you know, you maybe give us um, a sense of the benefits that you think that there would be from that, um, and how you feel that that can really inform and assist and help policy development. And maybe I suppose without wanting to load your answer, but was how citizens' advisory panels can remove the politics out of decision-making um, and how that may, may be very, very beneficial when it comes to uh, Northern Ireland. Absolutely. And, and first, if I may, I'd really like to pick up on, on the first of the points that you made in response to my last comment, because I, I really very strongly agree with that. I think that the last year has created up the opportunity for people to reflect on the, the very wide range of things that matter to them in life. But I think it's also been a really useful opportunity for us to recognise that um, these are not either or. So you cannot have strong economic growth if you do not have a healthy population. Uh, so some of the debates we've seen, uh, which have tended to try and polarize and talk about um, about uh, economy or health actually have been shown not to be helpful. The, having a holistic fr framework that exposes the interconnectedness of things has, I think, been really helpful dur during this past year. But yes, to move on to the points about, uh, about public engagement, Part of the appeal of a well-being framework, and we've seen this uh, in many of the places where one has been used and implemented, is that it provides a framework for government to reflect what matters to citizens. And it's a way of having a discussion with citizens about what matters to them, uh, not only at the point of actually creating the outcomes framework, but then using that as an ongoing, an ongoing discussion. And... Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I said a moment ago is that in, in, in the, the model that we use for talking about well-being, one of the four key components of that is democratic well-being. And we know that what makes for a healthy democracy is a place where there's a good level of understanding about what government does and support from citizens and trust of citizens in what government does. And we have observed the increasing experiments that have been uh, in different parts of uh, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland and elsewhere in recent years in a more deliberative democracy, as it's called, being a really useful way to create the space for that. Part of the reason for that, as you say, is because it is a way of um, taking some of the harsher side or the more antagonistic side of party politics out of discussions. But it's also partly because a lot of the issues which ultimately become uh, subject to tension within party politics are often very complex. And it can be quite difficult for citizens to fully understand um, some of the complexity and nuance to these, unless they've had an opportunity to really engage with the evidence. So one of the things that citizens' assemblies can do, or uh, smaller versions of those called mini-publics or citizens' panels, is to present citizens in a, a kind of calm, rational, open way with the evidence that goes into making policy decisions. And what we find very often when that happens 
is that people recognize that you know, very few of these issues are simple black and white, that there are judgments involved, and that it's possible to reach a judgment which may be different from the person sitting next to you at the table, but by working through the thought process, it's possible to understand why you could legitimately come to one view or the other. We've seen this uh, happening recently in, uh, in both Scotland and England on climate change, where there's been an opportunity to explore some of the very complex issues in relation to that. And I think also to expose the complexity and the difficulty that's involved in, in decision-making, particularly funding decisions. And at the end of it, the citizens are not asked to make the decision, of course, that's properly the job of elected representatives. But I think they do better understand that the elected representatives have to weigh complex issues in reaching those choices. Yeah, it almost sounds like every one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have with a constituent in the street that says, why did you vote that way? And it's like, well, have you thought about this? And we had to consider that, and we had to give a balance. And oftentimes, once you have a conversation like that with somebody, they understand that you, it's not just black and white issues, it's not a straightforward process. So, um, yeah, can, uh, the, there would be real benefit to that. But th thank you for those uh, answers from yourself. I'm going to ask if um, Doug Beatty would like to come in there for some questions. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Sarah, thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I'd love to just sit around a table with a pot of coffee and just chat about that for a long time. There's so many things to do. To, to and and you you just maybe can't you you just can't cover it here because every time you mention one thing something else spins off from it and 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 it links into pretty much our society in in every every single form. I mean, I'm I'm just reading here uh, about you know the, the hosting meaningful public consultations and 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 how do we how do we do that, Sarah? How do we host meaningful public consultations? What takes primacy? If political parties agree something and then a public consultation says, actually, no, I, 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 we don't like that. That's not the way we want to go. How do we counter that? How do we, how do we change it? At what level do we have these public consultations? And how do we really make them meaningful? Because I, I've got a sense that we are in process with public consultations. I just do not feel that what comes out of a public consultation is is really affecting what we want as in because of our makeup of the way we do stuff we decide what we want as political parties as an executive and then we do it and then we ask the the public to endorse it but if they don't we just do it anyway yeah so how do you how do you fix that problem yeah so so you're absolutely right i think i think in many places the approach to engaging people in decision making is changing it is partly changing because citizens expectations are changing if you think about you know social media all the other opportunities that people have to express a view they increasingly want to be doing that in an ongoing basis in the democratic forum as well not just once every four or five years when they exercise their their right to vote and it's therefore really important that People are clear what it is that they are being invited to express a view on and that the executive or its equivalents elsewhere is very honest and open about that. So if there are things which are truly um, the matter of political decision and that decision has been taken, then be very clear about the, the parameters for, for consultation or in, for input matters. But I think that even within a context where there is legitimate responsibility and right for politically elected uh, representatives to take decisions. Throughout the continuum of the policy making and the policy delivering process, there are opportunities for those decisions to be discussed with citizens, informed by citizens' views. Um, and uh, increasingly, we see that not so much being at the kind of um, upstream point of decision making, but about where service design is happening. So at quite a local level, again, we've seen that through our work with community planning partnerships and local authorities in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, that the more that people can involve service users in saying, this is what my experience is like, this is what matters to me, this is how I need to receive a service, then the more likely it is that an efficient and effective service will be designed that meets their needs. I think the other observation I would make, and, and interestingly, I say this, my, my, my life before working for the Trust was as a senior civil servant in the Scottish government. And I, I guess I've been over through this cycle in the last 10 years or so as a civil servant who's had to learn, alongside, I would say, some of the Scottish ministers, 
that we have to break quite a lot of our old ways of, of, of being and our old ways of behaving. And that I think you, I think I would certainly say you grow up in the civil service, and I suspect the same is true of ministers, um, with everyone expecting you to be the people who have the answers. And that when you go out and meet people, they ask you stuff and you tell them how it's going to be. And it was quite a big, um, it was quite a big learning curve to go to meetings with people and to say, you know, there's some things I know about, but there's a lot I don't know about. And I will be a much better policymaker if you can help me understand what your life is like and how you see things. Now, that didn't mean I was making them promises about how things would be, but it meant that we had to create new opportunities for listening to people. And I think going back to the, the, the words of your question, meaningful consultation, meaningful conversations are actually very often about just creating those spaces, the kind of spaces that I'm imagining you have in your constituency context, but which government tends not to do quite the same way. And the more that people can learn how to do that and build their skills in doing that, the better, I think, for the quality of, of policymaking. Yeah, I, so you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you talk an awful lot of sense. I, I think we have a culture which is really hard to turn here, um, I, I guess. And, and that sort of upstream or, or downstream sort of consultation is, is trying to figure out wh where it is and, and, and how do you get um, by. And so, you know, it, you know where, where you have a governable government department but is delivering something at a local level, such as a a, an educational sort of policy within a particular area, you know, uh, and they engage with the people and the people say, no, we don't want that. But the, 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 the government department says, well, you're getting it anyway. So do you, do you, the question is, do, do you, is the engagement that upstream to say, look, we don't want it like that. This is the way we want it. Or is it downstream where they say, no, so this is what you're getting. Now help us design it. You, you, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I, I would say, um, you know, one of the real values of, and again, one of the, the things which tends to characterize your know, healthy democracies is a really engaged dialogue with citizens all the way through. And I, and I certainly do take the view that there is no threat to representative democracy in that at all. I think it's absolutely clear that there are decision making points for governments, but that the more governments engage with citizens, in trying to discern what they should do and how they should do it, and then how they report back on how it's gone, the more likely it is that citizens will feel a high level of trust and that they will feel engaged. And also going back to my earlier point, that they will understand the context of decision-making because the nature of political decision-making is you will never please everyone with what you do. But the more that people understand why you've made the choices that you have, whether that was the one that they would have personally endorsed or not, the more likely they are to be able to be an engaged, active citizen. And uh, I, I would therefore say that the, 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 more, the more the better, and also that there is increasingly uh, sources of expertise in this. And there are many organizations working uh, both locally and you know, nationally and internationally who are really good at holding the space and sometimes using a third party organization to do that can be helpful if you want to take some of the politics out of it as, as, as the chair was suggesting earlier. Brilliant, sir, thank you very much. Thank you, chair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dublin. Yeah. I mean, really, I think really important points because I know that certainly in the past, I would have said that consultations were nearly too late to actually ask people for their views because it was so obvious by the consultation that many of the decisions had already been taken. And I would have been advising groups to get in at the pre-consultation stage to try and shape the consultation. But I think we're actually nearly, we've got the stage that the pre-consultations are all already uh, decisions taken. So it's getting in as early as possible before any decisions have been taken. And, and, and that's the trick. Um, I want that we have more of the members on screen now. So I want to offer it if there's anybody else that wants to ask a question. Um, I don't know how to pick because there's no hands up and use that feature here, but I'll just ask maybe Trevor Law, do you have a question to ask there or a comment? Yeah. Okay, I think we've we've lost Trevor there. So, um, or is it me? No, it's not me. Um, Pat, would you have a question there? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, and, and thanks, Sarah, for your your presentation there. And we believe that the outcomes based approach can help reduce inequalities in society, whether it's socioeconomic, health inequalities, or education inequalities. Mm -hmm. 
and all this while tackling climate change and uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, there are more environmental protections. But would you agree that it's crucial for departments to produce action plans detailing how they intend to achieve their goals? Thanks. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's worth saying that uh, when I put Northern Ireland in its international context, one of the things which is unique about Northern Ireland, it is it is located this kind of outcomes framework within the programme for government. And um, I think we would argue that is actually not particularly helpful. It might be it might be necessary this time for the purpose of consultation. But actually, after that, it needs to be elevated to a level above the programme for government and successive programmes for government. And it's the programmes for government that need to spell out the action plans, as, as you call them, or the strategies or the delivery programmes, mm -hmm. which will deliver the outcomes. And each of those programmes, of course, needs to have its own outcomes and its own measures and tests of success. And indeed, you know, members of the Assembly will, will hold uh, the executive to account for, for delivery on those. The, the value of having the outcomes framework is that you can look across all of those delivery programmes and ask yourself, do they add up in totality to the vision that's expressed in the in the outcomes framework? So you might look at a whole series of action plans and strategies within a program for government and say, well, those well cover off two thirds of the outcomes, but there's not very much at all on the environmental side, for example. So in a way, it gives you a framework against which to test those action plans, but it's the action plans that are absolutely critical. Again, interestingly reflecting on my experience in, in Scotland, I think in the early years of having an outcomes framework, the, we almost fell into the trap of over-fetishizing the outcomes and forgetting that outcomes don't just magically deliver themselves somehow, that the way in which you get to outcomes is by having a really well-selected set of action plans, inputs, targets that you deliver. And it's only when you delivered those, assuming that they were the right things to do in the first place, that you will make any impact on your outcomes. So I think it's really important to keep these two things in view. And the outcomes framework is a bigger context in which you judge the political decisions about what to do and how well those are being delivered. Yeah. And, and how do you ensure that departments don't continue to work in silos, that there's a uh, cross-departmental collaboration. So take, for example, uh, having a, a, an outcome of increasing educational attainment, uh, and there are many factors involved in, in, in how children uh, perform in school, and, and, and the greatest uh, cause of, of educational underattainment is poverty. So if children are living in, in, uh, in bad housing, damp conditions, uh, increased chances of, of illness, uh, you know, schools maybe surrounded by fast food outlets, uh, all, all of those sorts of issues which would impinge on, you know, maybe them missing school, maybe them having poor diets so or falling into, uh, into health problems and so on and so forth. So there needs to be cooperation across health, education, Department of Communities here, which would have planning, all, all of those sorts of issues. So how, how do you ensure that that happens? Yeah. So you've picked my absolute go-to favourite example of why it is that you need horizontal working in order to, to deliver outcomes. I mean, you know, you don't need me, you've got it, you've got it taped. Um, it, it is absolutely the case that by definition, delivery of an outcomes approach requires different ways of working. And I think I probably try to ram that home more than almost anything else that I say about this when I'm talking to governments that are trying to implement an approach like this. Uh, it's Of course, it's important you get the technical stuff right, that you get your framework and your outcomes and your indicators. But without culture change to ways of working, then you won't make any progress at all. And I think that unless that is deeply understood and acted upon, then uh, you won't get the kind of change you're talking about. So what does that require? Well, it, re it requires very visible, consistent leadership from the top, because we know that governments everywhere traditionally work in these silos, as you call them. And, and in Northern Ireland, that is a more deeply embedded tradition than it is in, in some other places for reasons that we understand. So everybody needs to see that from the very top, there is a consistent message that says, the, the horizontal joining up 
uh, approach to delivering outcomes is more important than the, the vertical siloed working. And it needs to be incentivized. And again, I, I can recognize that from my own experience of having had a, you know, a long career in the civil service where what was absolutely incentivized and rewarded was supporting you know, my minister, looking upwards, to deliver my vertical program. And then suddenly in 1997, when the outcomes-based approach was introduced, we had to find new ways of incentivizing and rewarding people, not for that kind of looking up, looking down approach, but for seeing how people reached out across the organization, put together coalitions of, of colleagues to work on issues. And I think one of the ways you can do it is to start by working back from the outcome. So in exactly the way that you've just described, if instead of an individual department thinking, oh, what can we as education do about educational attainment? You start by doing that kind of contribution analysis that says, let's get, let's get out on the table here. All the things that we know contribute to improved educational attainment. And as soon as you've done that, as you've just described for us, you will have a tick in the box of almost certainly every single department in the executive. And then you say, right, how are we going to find new ways of working together? to deliver these outcomes. Who's going to contribute this? Who's going to contribute that? And how do we hold ourselves to account for it? But it has to go right through the organization and even very practical levers like you know, how, how performance management is, is done. How do you describe as an individual senior official what your job is ought to look different if this is being properly done? And I think the other thing that you need to do is to look beyond the organization, because again, in the example that you gave us, not all of those aspects of contribution to educational attainment will be within the remit of the executive. Some of them will be within the remit of local authorities. Some of them will be very ably done by the social and community sector. So you need to really make a broad tent and find ways of ensuring that everyone's contribution can be recognized and valued in that. Okay, thanks for that, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pat, for that. Okay, um, Emma, George, any, any questions, George, there? Yes. Chair, I'm fine, and uh, thank, thanks, Chair, for an excellent presentation. Okay, thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, I can't see, are you, would you be looking in there, Trevor Clark, are you happy enough? Emma? No, okay, that's grand. Uh, Sarah, there we go, I just checked through everybody. So th thank you very much indeed for your presentation today. Um, really, I think there is a lot of reading in the document and really would advise members to make sure that they get a good uh, look through that because you know, I think if we look at the Scottish model and we often do um, sort of almost benchmark ourselves alongside the Scottish model, I think it is leaps and bounds ahead of, of where we could be. Uh, and I suppose if we reflect on that maybe positively, we'll say that we're at the beginning of the journey or, you know, 2016, that move to the programme for government was the beginning of the journey. Uh, and just that maybe with a good political will all around, we'll continue on that journey. But there's certainly good resource and good support from the work that you've done yourself. And we appreciate you coming here today to share that with us. So thank you very much indeed. Not at all. You're very welcome. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, members, we will um, move on then. Thank you to Sarah for that presentation. We'll move next um, to item seven, which is the forward work program, which is on page 181 of the meeting pack. Just to highlight for members that the uh, meeting with the Economy Committee is being arranged for the afternoon of the 16th of June. Uh, and it will actually, we're lucky, they're going to meet us at our time. So we'll have our normal meeting time of two o'clock that day. And just to note that the interim head of civil service has been invited along to that as well. We have an outstanding request from the Community Foundation of Northern Ireland to brief us on citizens' involvement in terms of COVID recovery. Um, if members are happy, we'll issue an invite to them. I was going to suggest if we bring them in the week before that meeting on the 16th of June, if there are any issues on the COVID recovery, then we could actually raise them with the interim head of civil service at that meeting the following week, as it will be roughly on the same theme. So it kind of makes sense to have one uh, almost as a bit of a briefing and preparation for the week after. Would members be happy enough with that? Okay. Um, and also, we had mentioned last week about trying to maybe put together uh, a series of uh, items on an agenda 
um, for the HIA meeting, and we've we've set aside the nineteenth of May, where we're getting a presentation from the Victim and Survivors Service. So we'll we'll have a few other things on that day as well. So that's the the forward work program. Our members happy enough to note on that, or any comments? Oh, okay. We'll take it. They're happy to note. Then, if we move to correspondence, which is of item eight. There are six items on page 188 to 211. Maybe just to highlight that on page 200, it's item 8.3. There is correspondence from the Clerk of the Assembly regarding the Public Services Ombudsman Act Northern Ireland commencement order. That's statutory um, uh, the SR that needs to come uh, to the committee. We had the presentation from the Public Service Ombudsman a few weeks ago. So basically just to say that we're at the scenario now where the uh, Assembly Commission will lay um, the uh, statutory instrument that will then trigger the Ombudsman to develop those principles that she referred to in her presentation, which will then come to us for consideration and then our decision passed on to the Assembly. So uh, just maybe to note that, uh, that that is in progress. Is there any other item on the correspondence that any member would like to raise? Okay, so we'll note the rest of the correspondence. Any other business that any member would like to raise? We're powering on then to item 10, which is the date, time and place for the next meeting. So we'll meet via Starleaf this day next week, the 20th of April at 2 p.m. So members, thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. And we'll see everybody, if not before, but we'll see them next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Committee Room 30.